Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Astara. Lily, Chloe, and Jamie are in the other room. I want to remind you to please stay safe and healthy. Hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. And please help support me on Patreon as Patreon as Astara Star Seed. And the link is in the description right below, right before the description of the book. And we are going to get back into Thomas More's Utopia. We're actually just finishing up by doing the analysis and the summary and the analysis to Thomas More. Where's my... Oh, I left them over there. <laughs> I'm going to grab those. Not my glasses. These ridiculous things over there. And then I'll get into the summary analysis of book, of book two. And the conclusion. Let's see here. Sign in to my notes here. Okay. Take me a second, I guess. Might say I should have loaded it before. Sometimes this thing's an old tablet and it's it takes a minute. One, one moment. On to the summary of book two in Utopia. First half. In the first half of the book, two Book two, Raphael describes the natural geography of Utopia and then addresses the major cities, the system of government, the social distribution of labor and responsibility, and how the Utopians travel. Throughout book two, Hithloday praises the Utopian customs and fails to offer any negative criticism. In Utopia's instruct introduction, the, the quatrain mentions that Utopia was made into an island. In book two, Hithloday explains that the general utopist dug through this narrow isthmus that, con that connected Utopia to the mainland. Neighboring villages mocked Utopus because his ambitious project seemed doomed to fail. What Utopus and his men achieved in a relatively short period of time astonished these naysayers. The island is roughly circular in shape and its natural harbors are na navigable. The straits of Utopia are dangerous with shallows with shallows and rocks. The Utopians have mapped and mastered these waters, but the shallows and rocks successfully deter foreign invaders. The island has 54 cities sharing exactly the same language, customs, institutions, and laws. The cities also have the same planned layout. Much of this is due to the civilized, civilizing excuse me, influence of, the, of Utopias, who trans formed a crude and rustic mob into a culture of note. Amorat, the capital city, is located at the center of the island, and every year each city sends three delegates to Amorat to discuss common problems. The Utopians regulate the size of each household, organizing the households, in, households into governable un units. In addition to its cities, Utopia has a wealth of rural farming land, each citizen serves a two-year stint in the country and then returns home. As a result, the hard light labor of a farming is distributed across the population and everyone learns the necessary agricultural skills. Utopia enjoys a surplus of goods and the, the country villages and cities freely give to each other without receiving anything in exchange. A Morat sits on the banks of the Ander River, the largest river in Utopia. The Ander is pure water near Amora, upstream. The Anider becomes salty and flows into the ocean. The Utopians built a stonework bridge and fortified the area. The houses and streets are planned in design, aesthetics and dimensions, and the model is duplicated across the island. Each house has a garden, and Utopians take great pride in their gardens. There are no locks on the front doors, and these doors open easily with the push of the hand. As a result, there's nothing private anywhere. Utopians exchange houses every 10 years. Stretching back 17, 6, 17, 000, 1, 000, excuse me, 1760 years, you know what it is. A little flubby with the tongue here. The history of Utopia is well preserved. Magistrates are elected from groups of families and the highest of these magistrates serve in the Senate and elect the ruler of the people. Unless he is suspected of trying to become a tyrant, the ruler serves for life. Most other positions are year-long.
all people, which is good. I think year-long's great. And then if they uh, they think someone's becoming a tyrant, then they boot, boot them. All public business must be conducted with the public assemblies and it is capital crime to hold such discussions elsewhere. Furthermore, in the Senate, no point is discussed on the same day during which is it is introduced. These measures aim to prevent conspiracy and prevent short-sighted decision-making. In terms of occupation, all the utopians, both males and females, are trained in farming, though everyone learns another trade. Children generally learn their father's trade. If a child wishes to learn another trade, the child is adopted into a different household. Interesting. Individuals are also permitted to learn two trades in this manner, and they can then practice whichever trade they prefer unless the city has a greater need for the other skill. The utopians believe in working smart rather than simply working hard. Yeah, you've, you've heard that before, and that makes sense. Work smart, not hard. I've, worked that, I've heard that right out when I was being trained by some of my, my best trainers. If you're the good trainer, that's what they, you know got to be efficient. Efficient, I mean, some people are fast and some people are efficient. And I think the efficient ones are are, are better because, um, well, they've got everything organized in such a way that you can still be just as fast. And then, you know, you, you, at the end of the night, like I work in retail, so, and then I some, and help stock freight and things like that. I may not be, like, fastest at what I'm doing, but I try to be efficient and clean up as I go along and, and everything like that and get started as soon as possible and have a pretty much of an efficient whereas people that try to go fast may may be fast and that's that's great but they're also kind of you know shoddy the, the work is shoddy and at the end of the night they gotta clean up and they may end up having to stay late because of it and that's why I like efficient rather than I mean, yeah, try to go as fast as you can, and be, but you got, you got to keep efficiency in mind. I like that one. They work only six hours each day, sleeping for eight hours and devoting the remainder to meals and leisure. Most of the utopian leisure activities are edifying or intellectual. They have morning lecture is mandatory for these those elected to pursue intellectual activities as a trade, but regularly attended by a good number of ordinary people. The equitable distribution of labor enables utopian, utopia to produce a surplus of goods. There is no leisure class. There are no beggars, swashbucklers, religious orders, or men, m malingerers, which is good. Nor, nor is one sex com exempted from or forbidden to work. There are no gu guilds to deliberately keep the, 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 the supply of goods fixed and scarce. Raphael suggested that Britain would do well by eliminating idleness. The utopians are vigilant against the spread of vice in, in their leisure time. They play a game resembling chess in which the virtues are lined up in a battle against the vices. The game shows how vices and virtues interact and attack one another and how one side ultimately overpowers the other. From this game, utopians learn how to use their virtues to overcome their vices. Utopians select their ambassadors, priests, tranibors, highest magistrates, and the ruler himself from the order of scholars. Scholars are selected based upon their intellectual promise at an early age. Sometimes an artisan makes great progress in his own leisurely intellectual pursuits, and he is promoted to join the scholars. Raphael devotes a good amount of time to explain the social relations of utopians in greater detail. Utopians create households that are extended families. Sons and grandsons excuse me, often start their families within the household of their youth. The oldest parent rules each household. The family structure is not in, inviolable. However, when cities are over or under unpopulated, when a household is fewer than 10 or more than 16 adults, persons are moved from one household to another. If the city is overpopulated, the excess population moves to underpopulated cities. Each city has 6,000 households. When the island is overpopulated as a whole, the government recruits citizens to colonize nearby areas of the continent, whereas where the natives have plenty of uncultivated 
land. Either the natives adopt the utopian laws and customs or they are driven off the, the land. And that's the way it should be. You come to someone else's land, you should adopt their customs. And unlike, you know, people coming in to America and say, well, we come over here, but we want it this way because we're offended. See, that's, the utopians weren't quite that liberal. And you, you don't do that. That's not cool. You don't just try to change, you know, when you come into someone else's governing government. Each city is divided into four equal dis districts and the marketplace occupies the center of the city. The head of each household offers his good, good and obtains whatever his household needs. There is no exchange of money and no direct exchange of goods, but there is plenty of everything and no reason to hoard goods or deny them to others. In the city, each block of houses has a di dining hall in which the households eat together. Stewards from each hall go to the market to get food for their meals. Hence, in the cities, the utopians eat their meals in large communal groups and not as isolated families as the case in the as is the case in the countryside. As always, the utopians seek to advance the moral education of their peoples, especially their the youth. The common dining halls feature brief lectures, reading, followed by discussion. Young people are seated with their elders to prevent the youth from misbehaving. In Utopia, there is no problem of traveling bands of rogues, nor is it possible for an individual to escape the civic obligations by traveling another city. When utopians travel, they must join in the labor of the resident citizens, otherwise they are not fed. Citizens must first get the permission of the magistrate to travel, and husbands must have their wives' consent. See, they're not really completely liberal either from the looks of it. They're gonna actually, I think they got a pretty good idea. Somewhat pretty good idea. Hippoday concludes that these traveling individuals remain just as profitable and useful to the state as if they never left. With the eye of everyone upon them, the utopian have no wine taverns, no alehouses, no brothels, no occasion to be corrupted, no hideouts, no hangouts. Utopia believes in storing a full year's worth of provisions as reserves. The excess supply of goods is exported to foreign lands as a, at a reasonable price, and one-seventh is donated to the poor in foreign lands. See, they, they do try to help the poor as well. Utopians import iron, which they lack at home, and they also bring back vast quantities of silver and gold. The balance of the trade is well in utopian favor. As they impart far less than they export, gold and silver are held in low regard upon the island. Utopians use these precious metals to decorate criminals, slaves, and children, and as a result of the stigma, good and sil silver are never stolen or hoarded. Hence, these metals are always in great supply and are available in case of war. The utopians follow a keen sense of virtue and rationalism. They seek to avoid the social complications of private wealth and class structure, and they rely upon an education in reason, morality, and religion to keep utopians well behaved. Utopians believe the greatest pleasures to be those of the mind and not the body, and they devote much of their free time to these pleasures. Analysis. In Book 2, Raphael Hitlerday develops the motive of perfection. A series of images and, and symbols support the nation, notion of utopia as a good place, and utopians are the, as the ideal people. Garden imagery, many gardens and love to garden. In symbolic terms, utopians enjoy, enjoy a pure Eden-like life, free of many real-world concerns. On a practical level, the garden imagery also reflects the agricultural skill and abundant harvests of the utopians. The strength of the civilization is seen in the life and vitality of its crops and vegetation. Thomas More's combination of urban and agricultural features makes utopia unique and modern work. I, I mean, I think it really goes well with, with today. And I mean, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, it's communism, blah, blah, blah. Well, pure communism was, was good, but they hear that word and they think evil. Well, the way... Communism is run in these countries is bad. I mean, it's not exactly for the benefit of people, but the way this book reads is it's more of a, a social benefit to people. And they call it socialism. Well, call it what you like, you know. And they use those words to scare you. But it doesn't sound all that bad to me. They, they use those words to scare you because they want greed. 
Utopian ideals fills the cities. Uh, if you get a group of people to go around that actually would live this life, it would be a great place to live. <laughs> Utopian ideal fills in the cities, the, the cities with gardens and surrounds each city with agricultural land. The land symbolizes Eden, but there's certainly social commentary reflecting Moore's Britain. Utopians have not constructed congested and dirty cities like London or, or like New York from today. Nor have they devoted land to the wasted pleasures of the nobility. More than Eden-like gardens, Uden, Utopians are stewards of the land and they carefully husband their resources. This connects the imagery of perfection and gardens to the themes of virtue and public services. Besides the gardens, there are other images of perfection. Utopus constructed a whole plan of the cities of Mora, and Utopians sustained this zeal, urban planning and design. 1760 years later, the island is circular in shape. The cities are perfectly arranged, and the cities are divided into four equal districts. For the Utopians, equality is a visual image of perfection. Cities are the same size. Houses look the same. Each city has the same number of adults. And considering Utopia as a philosophical treaty and Utopia as a model civilization, we find that the theme of truth becomes very complicated. There's the question of feasibility, assuming that the Utopians' beliefs are truly true and morally correct. How useful is the information of Moore's audience? Hitler Day asserts the Utopian policies could improve Britain's condition. It could improve America's condition, too, but oh my gosh, would that take work? But Utopia's world, okay, excuse me, but Utopia's condition seems unrealistically advantaged. Indeed, Utopia is described as the opposite of the real world. Uh, I've discussed that because people are kind of greedy and, and it's not, I'm not to, but there's a lot of people that wallow in ignorance and not very enlightened. And I don't mean that as, as uh, an ignorance an insult, but this, I, okay, let's say more greed. And that's a human condition, unfortunately. I think we all have a little bit of it. We're not, none of us are perfect. More than a mere ideal, Utopia is a fictional society that has with the stroke of more pensively or pen easily solved the actual problems of real societies. Utopus really cuts through the isthmus that connects Utopia to the mainland. Here, more, more alludes to the Greeks' failed attempts to dig a canal through the Isthmus of Corinth. This historical episode was to, so well known in Moore's time that it became a proverbial figure of speech for failure. <laughs> wow. Utopia's capital city, Amorat, strongly resembles London. London has the Thames River and a smaller stream called the Fleet Ditch. But these are far dirtier than Utopia's in Nida River and Freshwater Spring. Even more significant, both the Anider and the Thames flow in from the sea with the city built on the river banks. London's bridge was built in between the city and the coast, restricting ships from traveling through the city. Morod's bridge is built further inland so that ships can sail the river into the city and through much of it facilitating trade. Utopia is Moore's reflection on his own society. It, it is not entirely fictional and imagined. Utopian's lifestyle also presents the theme of in innovation. The Utopians discover the best practices and seek to implement them whenever possible. Like Moore's contemporaries, the Utopians discover new lands and come into, the con into contact with new foreign ideal ideas as a result of international commerce and trade. The Utopians have rearranged their natural landscape, creating an island. This creates a tension between God's role as a creator and man's role as innovator. By the standards of democratic capitalism, the utopian ideal idea, which is what we live in in America, supposedly, seems more like an oligarchy now. The utopian idea of the common life is rather than, than a rather objectionable. Utopia looks like a like like a co lot like communism. That's what I was just saying. In the struggle to attain perfection, utopians depend heavily upon formulas of equality. Household size is regulated and individuals can be sent to other families to keep the numbers balanced. Utopians fear the vices of sloth, greed, and pride, and they take proactive measures to eliminate the possibility of vice. I think 
what it boils down to. And I don't want to listen. The, the humans, all of us, need a little more enlightenment and for anything like that to work. I hate to put so much that people are ignorant. Um, but we just, we need to, we are, well, I guess it is a form of ignorance. We need to enlighten ourselves, all of us. But some people are just plain greedy, too. And that's what uh, they would just discuss. And they don't want, it's like a meme, And that's usually the nobility. But unfortunately, propaganda has has caused them to be able to brainwash the masses and keep them in a sort of ignorance, to put it in a better way. Okay. But a good deal of freedom is sacrificed. It is. We are uh, told explicitly that the front door is open at the touch of a hand and there is no privacy. Sons and grandsons start their families as part of their father's household. It is impossible to take a leisurely vacation, must work even when traveling, and work hours are assigned by the state. Utopia resembles 1984 and Fahrenheit 451, which is going to be one of the books if you uh, sign up for my second tier in, in, pa in uh, Patreon. I will, I will uh, put it, use it as a, in a poll for you to choose from uh, 1984. I haven't got Fahrenheit 451, but I will go get that book as well. And, well, numerous other books that you can choose from as well. But those are the two more relating to Thomas More's Utopia. Okay. Okay, Utopia resembles 1984 and Fahrenheit 451, novels of dystopia that responded to big government, totalitarianism, and tyranny. Utopia resembles the Puritan Commonwealth that Oliver Cromwell established in Britain in the 1650s. It is hard to credit the utopians with virtue when their choices have been made for them. Tragically, the utopians, once an uncivilized mob, are civilized to the point that they remain indistinguishable from one another. They live in the same houses and wear the same clothes according to the guidelines of their planned communities. And I can see why some people might not like that. I mean, I even took a little kind of wariness to that idea. It almost seems like a sort of cult. But, I mean, everything else seems great. Utopia Summary and Analysis of Book Two, Second Half. Book Two, Second Half Summary. Utopians have slaves, including prisoners of war and battle. The children of slaves are not <clears throat> held in slavery. Utopians also travel to foreign countries to purchase and enslave criminals condemned to die. Utopians who commit serious crimes are also held as slaves, and they are treated most harshly. These slaves are a disgrace to the Utopians because they, these slaves had been given an excellent moral education, but they became criminals nonetheless. Raphael discusses a few other customs of the Utopians. They are skilled in medicine and they devote considerable time to spend to attending the sick. To the sick, the Utopian priests and also encourage euthanasia when a patient is terminally ill and suffer in pain, but this can only be done of the patient's consent. I mean, I know people that do go along with euthanasia, that's something that I don't like to talk about because I feel some, I mean, I, I know why people like it, uh, not like it, but they are for it because they don't want people to suffer. But with me, it's something to do with God. It, you know, I mean, it's, I, I feel like it's not my decision to just, you know, euthanize people or allow them to do so. Or, 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 or to be involved with the euthanasia. I don't want, I would not want to be involved with that. And I, I will not be involved with that. That's something, I mean, and I know they euthanize your pets that are, uh, I've had to have a couple, and I didn't go in there. Well, my fiance went in there. They weren't alone. Well, one of my kitties had cancer. The other one was almost, and she was 17. The other kitty had a stroke. I mean, she was healthy right up till the end, and then she had a stroke, and then she could barely move. <clears throat> those, those were very hard for me, and I don't know. I, I couldn't, I could not, if for a person, I mean, animals were closer to me, but I still even for, for a person. I mean, that's, and that's just where I'm coming from. But I understand other people's point of view, too. 
Raphael discusses the marriage custom of the Utopians. Women may not marry until they reach age 18, and men may not marry until they reach age 22. I guess they realize that men are less mature. <laughs> I'm just joking. Because Utopians believe that sexual promiscuity makes it difficult for an individual to live a happily married life. Premarital sex is illegal and severely punished. Before the marriage, the intended bride and groom are presented to one another naked. Now, I find this interesting. So that any sores or defects will be exposed and no one is duped or deceived. Utopian marriages last until death and divorces are rare, requiring the permission of the rule, ruler. Adultery is grounds for divorce and is punished with harsh servitude. The adulterer repeats the offense. The punishment is death. Wow. I'm not going to go there. It's not my decision. Like I said, not something like that. It's not my decision. The Senate has no penal code and punishments are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. The most ser serious crimes are usually punished with servitude rather than death because the society can benefit from the prisoner's labor. If these slaves are patient, and if, after a long period of labor, they show the, that they regret the sin more than the punishment, they're sometimes released in educating the case. The attempt to commit a crime is not distinguished from the criminal act itself. A criminal is not, a rede not redeemed by his inability to successfully complete the attempted act. At this point, Raphael's narrative becomes somewhat rambling and he discusses a number of issues in rapid succession. The utopians are fools and jesters to keep them entertained, but they all abhor the practice of mocking people who are crippled or disfigured, and that's good. I mean, no one really should do that. It is important to be well-groomed. That's good. And make sure you don't smell. <laughs> but the utopians consider cosmetics to be great, disgraceful. Well, I don't wear any. I got pretty decent skin. I've never really had any pimples or major problems. In the marketplace, utopians erect statues of virtuous men who have done good things to the, for the commonwealth. This servitude has as an inspiration for the citizens to live up to the standards of establishments by their ancestors. Anyone who, ca one who campaigns for public office disqualifies himself from holding any office at all, and lawyers are banned from utopia. Oh, I, th I think it's because they want you to, to uh, Plead your own case, and that way they, you know, you're not being coached. But that's for both sides. So I guess I can, if it's for both sides, plead in their own case. Maybe I think, you know, I mean, I don't want anybody think anybody to be. What's the word? I'm not blackmailed. That's not the word I want to look for. Set up. That's not the word either. I think you know what I'm saying. Though set up for a crime they didn't commit. Okay, where am I? In court, each citizen represents himself and tells a story without legal counsel. The Utopians believe it is easier this way for the judge to determine the truth in a given case. The Utopians do not make treaties with other nations because treaties are regularly broken. The Utopians consider themselves friends with the foreign peoples unless they, some harm has been done. Well, they got a point there. Regarding war, the Utopians are peaceful for but they are not pacifists. Now, that's the way it should be. Peaceful, but not pacifist. you got to protect yourself. You can't just let somebody walk all over you. So this is why I don't consider myself a liberal. When necessary, utopians will fight to defend their interests as well as the interests of their allies. Both women and men are trained in regular military exercises so that the... But it depends on the interest of the ally. You know, sometimes we fight wars so that the island is well protected. Utopians... Utopians also go to war if one of their citizens is unjustly disabled or killed in a foreign nation and the guilty persons are not turned over to the Utopian authorities. Rather than fight in wars, Utopians rely upon strategy whenever possible. They, often, they offer large awards for the death of enemy, their enemy rulers intending to head, of a conflict before it, before it begins, head off a conflict before it begins, at the very least sow the seeds of distrust with the enemy camp. Utopians offer a high, offer often a higher, often higher nearby tribe, the Zapolets, as mercenaries to fight in place of Utopian citizens. The Zapolets are perversely bloodthirsty, and they're eager to fight for the Utopians because the Utopians pay high wages. 
oftentimes is that pilots die in war, and so the utopians do not have to pay the high rewards promised. At the same time, the utopians regard those pilots as a moral scourge. They're not; they're only too happy to enlist these wicked men in order to use them up. I get it. Utopians will only use their own citizens as a last resort, and even then, only as a volunteer as if it is a foreign war. I like that. They protect their own people. But if the island should be invaded, men and women in good physical health fight to protect the commonwealth. Oftentimes, families go to the battle lines together. Only the adults, of course, for the utopians reason that soldiers fight harder to protect one another, especially in hand-to-hand -hand combat when family members become specially protective to one another. They have family members fighting side by side. The last major topic discussed concerns the religious and of the religions of the utopians through throughout the various religions there are few sects devoted to ancestors worship or the worship of some celestial body the vast majority of utopians are monotheists who believe exclusively in one god as a creator now i can because that's me smaller sects also agree that there is one supreme being and they call him mithras though the utopians do not all worship mithras in the same way or whatever you call them, the supreme being is all the same. The utopians were very interested in what they learned of Christianity. Hitler Day explains that the utopian concept of Mithras and many of the beliefs of the utopian religion was similar to tenets of Christianity. Hitler Day also adds that the utopians eagerly awaited the arrival of a Christian bishop, and they were debating whether they might simply appoint a bishop on their own. Christians among the Utopians mostly remained very tolerant. Where am I? Okay. Where do I, I just lost my place? Very tolerant of the other religions, and, and religions tolerance has long been enjoyed by the Utopians, which is good. Hitler Day recounts that an overzealous Christian minister was arrested because his incendiary speech excited riots among the people. That I, that's great. I think that's great because you've got some false Christians out there. Utopist, the conquering general, began the legacy of uh, religious toleration. The overzealous minister was not arrested for advocating for his own religion. He had free speech, but when, he, when the minister began endangering the safety of others, he was arrested. Tried, convicted, and sentenced to exile. See, so the exile, that's, that's, I think that's great. I think that's great. That I think is good. Utopist established the policy that no one should come to any harm because of his religion, and the Utopians work hard to allow for debate and discussion. The caveat to the Utopian policy of religious tolerant, toleration is that it is forbidden that anyone discuss, disbelieve in the immorality of the soul or deny that the world is ruled by providence, arguing instead that the world is ruled by mere chance. Yeah, where do we go again here? So they believe that the world is ruled by chance, not providence. That's probably true. I think because God gives us free will, so. Analysis. The second half of Book 2 covers a range of topics, including slavery, military practice, and religion. Moore's work gives us the opportunity to analyze the utopian society on multiple levels. Some would argue that the utopian institutions reveal a lack of trust in human nature. <coughs> utopians have multiple safeguards to protect the society against the threats of tyranny, fraud, and deception. Regarding treaties, the utopians unlike their old world counterparts, no longer trust in them or sign them. Either a treaty is broken or it is written with so many loopholes that it becomes ineffective, and we know that. I mean, you know, if you get all these loopholes in there, then they're using it to get away with doing what they're not supposed to be, then it doesn't work. The Utopians argue that legal and political language is consistently used to misre misrepresent the truth. By eliminating many of the, the contexts where, wherein truth is profitably abused, the utopians safeguard their values. One ex example is the fact that utopians ban all lawyers as clever practitioners 
the sly interpreters of the law. Well, it is well worth noting that the irony here that Thomas More, a lawyer, is in fact the patron saint of lawyers. Wow. In other words, he's brilliant. Towards the very end of Book Two, Hitler Day argues that utopia is morally superior to European society in which the poor citizens are defrauded and disenfranchised both through private chicanery and public laws. Hitler Day is convinced by the utopian's argument that a large body of law often serves, serves to protect law, the interests of the powerful sometimes running throughout, roughshod over justice. Utopia's narrative structure relies upon multiple narrators. The reader receives commentary from Hitler Day and more. Various political ideas are, pre are presented from a variety of source, sources, classical, biblical, religious, and utopian. This narrative strategy highlights the tension between enjoying a free philosophical exchange in pursuit of truth and enforcing and defending the truth once it is known. When in court, a utopian tells his side of the story without law, legal defense or expert witnesses. The utopians believe that truth is more easily ascertained when each individual gives his own argument. Nonetheless, the utopian elders believe that the ordinary people are unable to understand a full body of written law. Mm, that Well, that's probably true. I mean, you're just an average person that doesn't, you know. At a consequence, as a consequence, there remains a wide range of decision-making, wherein most utopians have a very limited role, if any. Utopians without legal participation from the masses, even as they fear the rise of tyranny. If a utopian makes the effort of campaigning for public office, he is immediately disqualified. Granted, utopia society is, is one in which the public good d dominates the private interest, but these regulatory measures also reflect fear that legal structures might be perverted and that truth might be distorted. Despite the rigorous moral education of utopian citizens, these safeguards and checks remain. The utopian philosophy is not without counterparts. In classical and early modern thought, early political thinkers agreed with the utopian regard for justice and happiness, but there is a considerable divergence within these viewpoints. Utopians generally believe that the ends justify the means. From the Greek word telos, end, the utopian philosophy could be described as teleological. The consequences of the utopian logical assumptions are far-reaching in many of the utopians. Most objections, objectionable customs, can be traced back to this original belief. Utopians purchase slaves and also use slavery as a punishment for serious crime. One justification for slavery is that the potential labor of criminals should not be wasted in execution. You might rather, I'd rather call them prisoners, work prisoners, because I don't like the word slavery. They work prisoners because of their, what they've done and that they have a chance of getting out. Utopians believe that war is a moral tragedy that should be avoided, and they loathe the neighboring tribe of treacherous, backstabbing warmongers known as the Zapolite, Zapolites. The Utopians employ the Zapolites as mercenaries and have these wild warriors do their fighting for them whenever possible. The Utopians' argument is that, in the end, the Zapolites will be used up, and this will be to the moral improvement of the region. When the Utopians are pressed to fight, however, we see that they use deceitful strategies with the precise intention of encouraging violence and distrust within the enemy camp. Zapolites are con contemptible for some of the very same traits that the Utopians seek to inspire in their enemies. Utopian policies often disregard ideas of family and privacy. In a defensive war, it is not uncommon to find an entire utopian family of adults fighting together, despite the psychological trauma or absurdity of wiping out an entire family. The utopians reason that the end product is better fighting. Troops will fight harder if they are literally defending their own kin. That may be true. The family unit can become a means of defending the state. Similarly, euthanasia is encouraged but not mandated in the case where an individual is terminally ill. 
Likewise, there is no horror in regards to the practice of assassinating enemy leaders as a means of preventing the great, greater loss of life in war. Should we be, should war begin, a troop of utopian sharpshooters stalks the head generals as a means of quickly routing the opposition. I didn't say I was for this. It's just part of the book. Utopians have a chimera philosophy that seems composed of diverse and awkward fitting parts. Their philosophy runs the gamut from the worst human violations, slavery, the pol policies of compassion that are well beyond the norms of modern democratic society. Utopians are not allowed to work as animal slot slaughters or butchers, or butcher the slaves, butchers. The slaves do this work because it is feared that such bloody labor will harden the utopians and cause them to lose their compassion. I like that. Oddly, slavery becomes a means of achieving an end to that compat to that, an end that it compromises. Moore does not present utopia as a logically coherent state, and he admits as much in the concluding letter to Peter Giles, utopia is a hodgepodge of legal policies, economic practices, and cultural institutions that exist so that Moore might pre present a set of issues for our contemplation. The remarks on the utopian religious practices reveals Moore's narrative strategy. The utopians are not described as Christians, but the religion is described as monotheistic practices, very similar to Christianity. Very early in the work, we learned that the utopians had already begun to embrace Christianity. The utopians were presented as a rational and unconverted pagans. It would have been difficult for Moore to present utopia as a society where it worthy of comparative analysis. The utopians are fairly tolerant of diverse religious practice, but they are not they are intolerant of atheists or, or those who believe that there is no eternal soul or that there is no afterlife. Yeah, I'm kind of intolerant of that too. I mean I don't believe what you want, but don't try to push it on me. Some of them annoy the crap out of me. The people that make this statement, blah, 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 well, but because you've got foreknowledge, you know, any more than anybody else does, there's definitely something out there. Well, was no sympathizer of heretics, and he makes a distinction between the level of toleration necessary for truth to emerge and the mandate and uniformity required once the truth has been revealed. Utopist, the old utopian general, argued that religious war would likely disadvantage the truth as the true believers were likely to be poor fighters. But one, once truth is established, uniformity in compliance is expected. The utopians hold the existence of one God as truth, and they bar any atheist from public office. <laughs> the utopians also hold the number of truth regarding how many hours one ought to work in a day where one ought to live, and what one's house should look like. Uniformity precludes dissent and denies the possibility of amendment. Because the utopians have not yet settled and on the precise details of God, all their religious services use common prayers. No prayers are devised which everyone cannot say without offending his own denomination. In 1549, 14 years after Moore's death, the Anglican Church installs its own book of common prayer in accordance with the first act of uniformity. The commonness implies exclusive inclusiveness. But utopian practices like those of Moore's society do not tolerate the possibility of multiple or relative truths. Moreover, truth is described as something that can be pragmatically approached, conclusively determined, yet there's only one truth. This is true. But um, God is the supreme being. And you can, don't have to go to church to do that. I mean to worship him. Utopia summary and analysis of conclusion. Conclusion summary. In final letter to his friend Peter Giles, Moore discusses the initial reception of Utopia. In particular, the writer describes a certain unnamed critic who generally approached, approved of the work yet found some of the Utopian practices absurd. Moore appreciates this critic who makes an effort to read carefully and pay attention to details. The form of the work Utopia should be judged separate from the, from the content of the work and the politics sees of the utopian society. Moore states that he does not agree with all the utopian practices. He has simply presented them to the reader. Finally, Moore 
argues that if his work were fictional, he would supply ample details to make this clear. Moore cannot attest to this, the truth of the work, and the reader must seek out Raphael Hitlerday if more information about Utopia is desired. Analysis. Moore takes a reflective tone in his final letter, but the reader should be well aware that Moore is not telling the literal truth. He describes his work as not necessarily a fictional pre presentation, which would make the truth slip more pleasantly into the mind like medicine smeared with honey. At the same time, Moore gives the con clues confirming that his work is fictional. The name Utopia means that the island is nowhere. The name of the city, Amorat, means phantom. The name of the river, Anida, means that there is no water. And the name of the ruler, um, Ademus, means that he has no people. The simile of medicine smeared with honey describes Utopia as a corrective book for the moral education of the reader. The fictional and inventive aspects of, are like honey, intended to sweeten the actual obje object. Moore's responses to the critic su suggest that the author does indeed have a defined sense of how his work has to be read and interpreted, though the wor worry he worries that the honey aspects of Utopia may discredit the work as a ph philosophical treaty. Moore remains confident that the careful reader will be able to extract the medicine, recognize the honey for what it is. And that is the end of summary and analysis of Utopia. And I feel, feel like that was a very good read. If you enjoyed this, though, please be hit, sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below. And please go down and hit my, go to my Patreon site and check out the different tiers and the different incentives to become a member of my Patreon. And also, please stay safe and healthy and stay tuned for more from Ostara, Lily, Chloe, Jamie. And in the next video, the next book, well, I'm still reading Les Mis, but in the next book we are going to get into something a little more light. Definitely a little more light like for your uh, your teenagers. Well, I read this when I was young. I think I mentioned I read and mentioned this the other day, The Outsiders. I think it's such a nice nice book, an easy summer read for a, for a teenagers and adults alike. I still enjoy The Outsiders as well. Well, if you enjoyed this, I already said that, but you have a great day. Thank you.